Hi, I'm Rick Crandall, host of the Behind the Wings podcast, and boy are we excited. In this episode, we get to talk to retired fighter pilot Randy Laz Gordon. Randy discusses pushing the limits as a test pilot. The centerline fuel tank of the F-18 separated off of the airplane, unbeknownst to us, and fell somewhere down on the Chesapeake Bay. And flying the F-15 in combat. It kind of dawned on me like, hey, idiot, they're shooting at you. <laughs> right, so start maneuvering. Let's get you to the Raptor now. Yeah. Thrust was off the roof. You can maneuver this airplane with reckless abandon. This one is going to be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. Before we get into today's video, I wanted to let you know that we recently launched a Patreon and YouTube membership. Check out the link in the description for more information and thank you for supporting our mission of aerospace education. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Colonel Randy Laz Gordon, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to share some stories and uh, talk about airplanes. You've flown over 70 yeah. different aircraft from a Zeppelin airship. Seriously? Yeah. To a fifth generation F-22. Yeah. So tell me of all the cockpits that you've sat in, and there's been a bunch of them, which one taught you the most about flying? The most about flying? That's a fascinating question. Believe it or not, it was that Cessna 172. When you look through the pantheon of great airplanes, I think the Cessna 172 is dramatically underrated because when you think about it, folks that have flown the space shuttle or you know, name your favorite exotic airplane, they've always begun with something like the Cessna 172. You know, especially as an engineer, for me, you, you appreciate the simplicity of the design and how it, it's rugged enough to tolerate really crappy pilots at that early stage of their flying career, but then teach them so much about the basics of hand flying an airplane and how an airplane works. And I've always really appreciated the fact that the basic things I understood there still apply to just an amazing amount of variety of very, very high performance kind of airplanes. I think the one that taught me the most, believe it or not, of everything I've ever flown is the 172. You've said before, the human mind is still the most powerful thing in a cockpit. Yeah. What makes a good pilot just beyond the technical skill? In my world, it was the world of being a fighter pilot. And in that world, things happen extraordinarily fast. You gotta be able to size up a situation very quickly and make a decision about what you wanna go do. And believe it or not, the hardest thing of being a fighter pilot was listening, right? Because you've got the helmet on, you've got the radio communications going back and forth. And in your mind, you're trying to build this mental picture of three-dimensional space as it's changing constantly of where are the bad guys, where are my guys, who's doing what. And the main way to do that, at least before the days of data link, was to listen. In the midst of everything you're trying to do to try to piece together what everyone else is trying to do, that, that was the hardest skill. Fighter jets, as a general rule, are pretty easy to fly, right, because they generally want you to focus your attention on everything else that's sitting out there. But what I found, and this is probably another great lesson, if you will, from being a fighter pilot, to become really, really good at anything, but especially at something so dynamic and so challenging as being a fighter pilot, it's the humility to accept feedback without ego, to embrace that, to address it, to fix it, and to have that constant mentality of, I'm going to be just 1% better on my next flight. That debrief culture is sorely lacking, I find, a lot in, in the private sector. And I have to remind myself constantly that, oh, these people didn't grow up as fighter pilots. They're not used to having a very honest debrief of things that could have gone well or better. That, to me, I, I think is the number one factor of what makes a great not just fighter pilot, but a good leader. And you, you just have to get really good at that. Over the course of your career, you've flown a lot of different aircraft. What was flight training like, you know, crossing over from the different airframes, right? Yeah. I mean, is it a big leap? If you can get the airplanes airborne, they're awesome. They're very much similar. <laughs> but everything from engine start to taxi out and get to the runway, that's the hard part with it. Because the switches are all in completely different directions. And the way that they're built and designed and they're operated is, is very, very different. Like we flew the Swedish Saab Viggen, which was sort of like their Cold War equivalent of like the F-4 kind of thing. Uh, but I remember sitting in the cockpit because you get a chance to kind of go, OK, where's everything? Where do we need? And at the end of the day, we all looked and we went, where's the gear handle, <laughs> right? And it turns out in Swedish design, the gear handle is almost like a parking brake lever that's on your back left. It's not, right, the lever with the big wheel that you grab and push up and down. And we're like, where, how do you raise the landing gear in this thing? You're like, oh, it's, it's back here. You know, si silly stuff. Like in the F-15, 
if you want to use the nose wheel steering, it's always active, and then you just push a button on the stick to make the nose wheel steering really go. In the F16, uh, the nose wheel steering doesn't work at all unless you activate it, turn it on, and then click it on and off, whatever. So little nuances and changes like that, that, that was always the hardest thing to figure out. You've flown the F-15 and F-16, yeah. um, iconic fighters, sure. right? If you had to sum up the personality of yeah. each jet, how would you describe them? Yeah, the, the F-16, they call it the jack of all trades, the master of none. I think probably next to the MiG-21, I think the F-16 is the most widely produced fighter, right, that's ever existed. And I completely see why foreign countries especially would want to purchase one because, you know, for the low, low price of the yeah. F-16, look at the variety of missions that it can perform. I see the personalities of like F-16 drivers as whatever you throw at me, I can figure it out and we'll, we'll make it happen kind of thing. The F-15 kind of reminded me of the priesthood of air supremacy, air dominance, because everything about that airplane was built for the idea of the air-to-air -air mission, right? I'm talking about the F-15C and the D models especially, where we would spend forever about where did you move your cursor acquisition symbols to be able to lock the bandit, and if you had just done this two seconds prior, you might have been able to solve this problem or that problem. There was a difference, right? The, the Viper was, we'll figure it out, we'll understand all these different aspects and be able to perform these missions. The F-15C model, especially in those days, was very much about, I do this. And I do this infinitely better than anybody else on the planet. That notion of we will not fail, right? Because so much is dependent on us providing air dominance so that the rest of the missions could get done. You had two active tours in Iraq and Afghanistan in the early 2000s. So yeah. beginning of enduring yeah. freedom. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of the mission sets. Any stories stand yeah. out from that? Everybody remembers their first combat mission. I remember mine very clearly. I remember not being able to sleep the night before because your mind is continuously racing for whatever reason. If something goes wrong and I have to eject or get out of the airplane, the people running to the crash site are not there to help me. But then when you get up and you go, okay, let's go, right, game time, and you get very focused. Just the act of starting the engines and the canopy coming down and the radio coming alive and running through your checks. Were they combat in the same way that Battle of Britain guys were or guys going, <laughs> no, it, it wasn't that. But you were still getting shot at, right? And that was the thing that was not widely publicized at the time is that the Iraqis were heavily incentivized by Saddam Hussein to make sure that they were taking pot shots, at least at the American Raiders, messing up their airspace. I'll never forget, you know, we're doing the Northern Watch mission. We're trying to defend to see if any airplanes kind of launch. And sure enough, I'm looking over at my flight lead and I see what looks like popcorn appear in between us. And then I see his airplane start maneuvering like crazy. I'm like, what's that all about? It kind of dawned on me like, hey, idiot, they're shooting at you. <laughs> right, so start maneuvering and so try to avoid and then we had to call it in, hey, this is where we encountered it, and you know, try to return fire with the Strike Eagles and the F-16s that we had on board. It was a trial that I wish a lot of people could go through. Everything you've ever wanted to get or achieve in life is on the other side of fear. And that first combat mission for me was, was very much that way. Well, let's get you to the Raptor now, yeah. a fifth generation aircraft. Yeah. What made it so different from some yeah. of the others? The Raptor took all of the things that were pretty good about the F-15 and it made them just awesome, <laughs> right? Thrust was off the roof incredibly. Holy crap, I can't believe this airplane <laughs> can fly with that amount of thrust sitting on the back. You know, the avionics, just even the look of the airplane, it was like a smoothed over, more aerodynamic version of the F-15. You also do this thing that uh, it's called the, the high alpha loop, which is a loop that you do in the F-22, but the difference with the F-22 is it's got the thrust vectoring on the back. So as you get into the loop, you get to the top of the loop, and rather than carving the top of the loop, it gets to the top of the loop and just pivots and comes down. There's always this balance uh, in engineering of what control do you give to the pilot vice what control do you protect the pilot from going out of control or over gene raptor found that perfect balance in fact there used to be a note i've been told right in the old what we call the dash one which is like the pilot operating handbook that says you can maneuver this airplane with reckless abandon <laughs> right? which is a challenge to fighter yeah, pilots exactly. oh i can we'll see how that goes but it's a 100 percent true statement of you could get to full speed, full afterburner, take the stick, pull it right back, and go right to 9Gs and never over G, right? Now, if you'd done that in the F-15, you would rip the wings off because it just didn't have that same level of protection assigned with it. But it got you to the peak level of performance of the airplane without going over that cliff and going over to the edge. So it is a supremely well-designed airplane 
from a flight control standpoint. And you've said that a, a typical Cessna is uh, somewhat comparable to an F-22 and much harder to fly. Yeah, once you get used to the, the speeds, because typical fighters will land around 150, 160 miles an hour, right? Which to a Cessna, that, you know, by that point, the paint's peeling off the outside <laughs> of the earth, like I'm not meant to go this fast kind of thing. Once you get past that part of it, maneuvering the airplane is pointy. What you see is what you get, right? Point over here, it'll coordinate all of the flight controls. I called it black magic and sorcery. You ask an input and something happens behind you and magically the airplane kind of turns in that direction or pitches up in that direction. Cessna, you very much had to be very thoughtful about, okay, I've gone into a turn. Now I have less lift on the wings. I'm going to have to pull back on the yoke so that I don't lose altitude. But because I'm in a turn now, I've got more drag on this wing than I do on that wing, so I gotta put in rudder to coordinate the turn. You're always in this mode of trying to stay ahead of the airplane, whereas Raptor effectively compensates for all of that. So the Raptor wasn't the first stealth aircraft, uh, but it really made some vast improvements, including radar absorbing material, RAM, yeah, yeah. right? The technology that goes into the radar absorbent material is, is still very, very well classified stuff. Sure. But the basic concept of it is, can I shape the airplane such that whatever radar information gets sent my way gets diffracted? And then whatever's not deflected, can I absorb it? And so that's why you see these stories of, well, it's got the radar signature of a bumblebee. And you come to find that th those airplanes from the beginning have to be built with that in mind, right? Of this all aspect stealth, you know, can I see it? Can I hear it? Can I, you know, see it with infrared? Can I find it with the radar, right? All those things, we try to make it very, very difficult to find. Oh, I want to talk about maintenance of it. Hard to maintain? Yeah, it's, you come to find that these are airplanes only a modern superpower kind of nation can, can hold, right? Because one, they are now flying computers, <laughs> right? You find that when you've got this airplane that is so software programmable, it's, it's wonderful from a standpoint of, hey, I can change a lot of this stuff on this airplane just by changing a little bit of code. But then it's also, it's one more level of complexity in terms of maintaining an airplane. You're flying as a test pilot right on the edge of what's possible. Do you ever have a uh-oh moment in one of those, uh, <laughs> those times you were up? We would go out and train what we called were advanced handling maneuvers. AHM is what the qualification that we called it for, where you intentionally put the airplane in very unusual situations. Probably my big uh-oh, like, wow, that was interesting, was flying with the Naval Test Pilot School in the F-18 with a new version of software that they had on board for the flight controls of the F-18, we found ourselves in this weird spot where the flight control logic wasn't built to understand that. And its answer was to just kind of give up. And the airplane whipped around in a way that we weren't expecting. And it, the, the whip around was so violent that the centerline fuel tank of the F-18 separated off of the airplane, unbeknownst to us, and fell somewhere down in the Chesapeake Bay. And it wasn't until another airplane joined up on us at the end and said, hey, uh, didn't you have a fuel tank <laughs> when you took off? And we went, well, well, yeah, do we not? And you're like, no, you don't. And it was like, holy crap, holy crap, stop, 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 stop. Right, and do a, what we call a battle damage check and make sure the airplane can fly well and come back down. It was a corner case, right? Which we find sometimes in the world of test piloting. Again, a successful failure. Wrap up with the Raptor. It's been 20 years now. Yeah. What's the Raptor's legacy? The deterrent effect of having an airplane like that on the adversary, the, the reality is that community is so good that even if they can replicate some of the technology on board, they can't replicate the training that we put so much investment into that you need those two combined to have this deterrent effect of air dominance. That to me is, is the legacy of, of Raptor. We always like to wrap our podcast up with a little bit of uh, wisdom from our guests or advice, if you will. I am nobody special, right? I, I didn't have the money, did not have the resources, no natural talent to be able to go do this kind of thing. But I think what made the difference was just dogged persistence. You're going to get knocked down, right? You're going to encounter naysayers. It's going to be difficult. But everything you want is on the other side of that, right? Just keep pushing through all of that. I'm going to keep knocking on that door. And yeah, you're going to tell me no, probably a lot of times. I Guess just need what? you to tell me yes once, <laughs> yeah. right? That, that's yeah. all I need. And in the end, you're a successful failure. Yeah, that's right. Successful right. failure. <laughs> this has been great. And uh, Colonel Randy, Laz, Gordon, thanks for your time. Yeah, no, thanks yeah, for this. And this was awesome. a great pleasure. 
Well, that'll do it, folks. We hope you enjoyed Randy's many great stories. What a great guest he was. To hear the full interview, go check out episode 60 of the Behind the Wings podcast wherever you listen. We couldn't get to everything, so let us know what questions you have in the comments. If you subscribe, thank you so much. And if you don't, just subscribe already. And if you want exclusive content, become a channel member on YouTube or check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash wingsmuseum. We'll see you next time, right here on Behind the Wings.